Good morning, watchers. Welcome to Brother Sal's Sunday gathering at the storehouse. I'm so pleased that you're here today, and I'm very happy to still be here. Well, there's a lot going on in the world, and I feel very badly about the incident over this past few days in France. But I know we've been talking about this for a long time, so and Tony's here with me today, and I'm happy that he is because he's because I'm sure he has a lot to talk about in the light of what's been going on in the world today. Welcome to the show, Tony. Good morning, Dad. I'm uh, still here in Budapest, Hungary, and looking over the the news. And uh, well, there's so much going on as we approach a, uh, what I think is the the Sunni civil war that's coming. And uh, I think the evidence for that, uh, you sent me something about the King of Jordan. I don't have it right here, but of course, uh, Jordan's being uh, asked to coordinate information now about uh, the Muslim world and, you know, who, who's ready to, to help lead the fight against this ISIS who not even, as we've talked about, not even the Muslims can stand these people. For, and our journalism can't seem to get their mind around the idea that an Islamic caliphate uh, is not possible in this in this context of a terrorist group having to uh, seize their own people, control their own people, these um, these militias that are are paid uh, by Saudi Arabia to you know they're mercenaries, this mercenary army. How, how this could be called a caliphate of Islam seems to escape our journalists in America and around the world who love to just keep pointing out to us that what a threat these people are and such. So uh, one of the things I find really um, informative this week on the Associated Press, this is from yesterday, Saturday, by Robert Burns and Lolita C. Baldor is something titled Pentagon Pressing Allies for More Help Against Islamic State. And uh, the article starts, Washington Associated Press, the Pentagon is pressing European and Arab allies to provide more troops and support for the war against the Islamic State group, hoping that the horror of the Paris attacks and the fear more are coming will compel them to get more deeply involved. So, you know, I think this, you know, anyone that's been listening to us for any length of time, Dad, knows that uh, all the way back from the so-called Arab Spring, we were pointing out that this was not an organic movement of freedom or democracy. The fact that Anybody in the West could pretend that the Western powers like the United States are interested in freedom and democracy, that we just got to go help Egypt, we got to help Libya, we got to help Afghanistan, we got to help Iraq, we got to help Syria now. I mean, come on. We don't seem to get so involved when they kill people over in Africa. And, uh, you know, I've talked about before that it's our weapons manufacturers that provide the weapons for the genocides that go on in Africa. And that doesn't even reach our press. Most Americans aren't even aware of the, the genocides that have been going on in Africa for so long. But of course, we're happy to believe that it's our American duty to go liberate and bring freedom and democracy to these countries of the Middle East. These Islamic countries that, you know, all my life have been raised to, to be told that these are our enemies. They have no religious freedoms. They don't, uh, 
they don't have women's rights, they don't have civil rights, they don't have any of the things that we consider essential in, in at least the propaganda of our culture. And yet, these are the people that, um, that we feel it's worth you know, driving the world broke to go liberate. So it's, it's all such a tangled web of, of lies and deceit. And I think in the last two weeks, I've really tried to, to provide a context for that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, engineering World War III. And last week, we talked about the prediction for the upcoming war in which it stated that that they needed to foment the war between Israel and the Islamic world such that they annihilate each other and that this horrible um, scourge of humanity would require that the rest of the citizens of the world get involved and that this is going to lead to some sort of atheist Christian annihilation uh, if, if this prediction is in fact uh, the, the agenda that's being followed and historically it's it's hard to find another one that lines up with the facts so well so anyway in this first article I I see that what we're pressing for here is that uh, or at least in the way that we've been reading it for many years with the rise of a of the good king, the white horse king from Revelation that has to go forth conquering and to conquer. We've been saying for so long that's got to be what we might call the, the good caliph or even perhaps the false messiah of the Jews. We'll, we'll have to see. We can we can draw some of those outlines now and, and watch the details fill in, but for certain, we've been pointing out since the Arab Spring that this was a setup to destabilize the region, to rise up a force that this good king would fight. And back then, we thought it might be the Muslim Brotherhood because there was no such thing as ISIS. But now it's quite clear that ISIS is the, at least the acronym for the, for the force that um, that's got to be raised in the world that fits this prediction from 50 years ago. And what I find still remarkable is I, I still cannot see one graphic in all of these articles that demonstrate that ISIS is anything but Hollywood. It reminds me of that movie, Wag the Dog, with uh, Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman. If you don't hear about that movie anymore, and I, I don't think that's an accident, but people listening to me might want to check that movie out because I believe that we're living in exactly that moment. I mean, we always have all of my life. The communism wasn't real. The threat of Vietnam wasn't real. The threat of Korea wasn't real. The threat that's being presented right now with China and Russia, these are all, this is Hollywood. This is all something that is being engineered to get us to a war that, that somebody seems to to want very badly and for very specific reasons. So this first article points out that now the Pentagon's pressing Europe and Arab allies to provide more troops and support for the war against the Islamic state. Uh, state. And as always, predicting uh, the fear that more of these horrible attacks are coming. You know, and I've been saying it for some time, Dad, that you can't get to this fever pitch that the that has been predicted either through the secular world of, of these um, William Guy Carr's uh, pawns in the game, where he talks about these three world wars that were predicted that he apparently heard about or read about from the book by Cardinal Rodriguez from the 20s. And Cardinal Rodriguez said that he got them, that he saw the letters, or that they were at one point in a British museum. And ever since then, the British Museum has confirmed that no, there never were any such letters. But we do have these quotes, and funny enough, the world has come down this path. So I, I won't repeat all that, Dad, but if for, for listeners, 
go ahead and listen to the last week's show called Predicting World War if you're interested in that. I want to just talk about a little bit of where we are today and where I imagine we're going to be heading real soon so that, you know, I, I know out on the internet there's just all these headlines look the same. And all I can tell to people that are tuning in to us is to check out the accuracy of what people are saying. I find that the headlines, in other words, talking about World War Three, Russia, China, predicting the world wars. I mean, you know, we all can say that, but what are the details? Who's Who's got their finger on the pulse, really? We've been pointing out that the Arab Spring was fake. We've been pointing out that the uh, the horns that that the Daniel prophecy predicts to be uprooted uh, were Iraq and Syria and Libya long before that happened from 2000 when they named themselves against this this so-called peace process that we're apparently still involved in that's resulted in nothing but death and destruction and the rise of the scourge that somehow was predicted 50 years ago. So we've been very accurate in these predictions of ours. And I even pointed out when we saw that first flag of ISIS that this was propaganda. Uh, they're not showing me anything yet that demonstrates that this is an actual movement. Uh, like the Vietnam War was an actual war. Those people in Vietnam were really standing against our troops and there was a war going on and that war was quite clear and it was broadcast in the newspaper now the reasons for the war and all that of course were all lies and the history that's been written is all fabricated but the war itself was quite real and there were troops and there were fighting and there was real gains and losses on both sides as as all of these these civilizations and these masses of people were clashing. But with regard to ISIS, I'm still wondering how it's possible that this flag from a year ago has turned into the scourge of the world. And now we're being told in one of these articles that the mastermind, the 28-year-old Belgian Moroccan mastermind has been killed in France. And he engineered it all from France. Nobody knows how he got in and out of Europe. But somehow, there he is on a cell phone, masterminding these attacks. And I just find it really interesting because, you know, we've watched this Palestinian-Israeli conflict most of my life with the rise of Yasser Arafat and the PLO. And... Um, you know, the Palestinians weren't really able to get much on the Israelis, were they? I mean, a few suicide bombs were told. And again, I, I I still like to see some proof of that. I'm not saying there's not crazy people that are willing to be brainwashed. Um, there's a history of that. I mean, you know, we know that the Nazi scientists were being paid to, to experiment on those poor souls at the time that World War II was going on, and we know that after World War II, those Nazi scientists were brought to America to continue this, the things that they were working on. And we have lots of evidence of things like the MK Ultra project and such mind control and, and these things. And, and there's even evidence that, that someone like Sirhan Sirhan uh, was part of this in, in the killing of Robert Kennedy that here's someone who's was brainwashed or mind controlled and was set off to go do this. And, and so th there is evidence of this kind of thing. And I'm not saying that, 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 that isn't at work, that some of these suicide bombs aren't real. I'm just saying that this culture of suicide bombing cannot be real because as I said last week, you can't turn that on and off like a faucet. Once people are committed to the point of giving their lives, you can't just tell them, well, stand down, we're going to talk about it, especially when it, nothing has changed. You know, Israel's only expanded. The Palestinians in Gaza have only had worse and worse and worse. 
the atrocities have only gotten worse. So where are all these suicide bombers that were, you know, a whole culture 20 years ago? Why are they not, you know, how come they're not able to penetrate Israel's defenses or anybody else? I mean, you know, I remember that we were scared of terrorism all the way back then. And, and Yasser Arafat and the PLO were quite well funded back then. They had nations that were on their side. And they weren't able to pull off any of this kind of stuff. And the reason is as simple as I've pointed out before, Dad. The, the reason banks aren't robbed anymore is because technology caught up with the bank robbers and you can't get away with it anymore. You know, you, you just can't get away with it. And yet we're led to believe that Osama bin Laden from a cave in Afghanistan can coordinate the... Uh, hijacking of airliners that can fly around United States defended airspace for 45 minutes, can fly them into buildings, which in itself is impossible. The fact that those planes penetrated buildings, it's physically impossible. Even the wingtips penetrated the six inch steel plates of the buildings. I mean, you know, the fact that we can be sold on that, come on, it's wag the dog, it's Hollywood. And so, um, you know, what, uh, what I'm trying to get across to people is that everything you're seeing in the media is false. Even the stuff that sounds real is still false because nobody's allowed to say what I'm saying. Only, you know, nutcases like me that have insignificant voices that nobody's listening to. The minute anybody starts believing what I'm saying you know, they'll find a way to turn us off or shut me up. But meanwhile, I find that our channel is one of the few that I've found because, I, you know, I've been searching out there for, for the truth on the Internet, and I find that it's all a bunch of bull, and it's all part of this wag-the-dog world, and especially now. And so anyway, let's talk about a couple of these couple of these crazy articles. So this first one, as I say, is telling us that now we're pressing Europe and Arab allies to provide more troops and support, which is, you know, again, the U.S. has been there for a year with all of our intelligence. We coordinate already with the Israeli Mossad, uh, the Pakistan um, intelligence service, the Turkish intelligence and uh, the intelligence and we haven't been able, we've read in the last few weeks, they're reporting to us that ISIS is not only, you know, not given an inch, but they keep expanding. They keep threatening. They keep pulling off, you know, they, they're killing people all over the world. Beirut just last week. Now we got this thing in, in Mali, uh, apparently, in this hotel over there, this Radisson Hotel this week where they've, you know, and gunmen went in there and killed a bunch of people over there. You've got Saudi Arabia, they've blown up bombs. Turkey, they've blown up bombs. Uh, bomb on that that um, Russian plane. Um, and now this French, this massacre by all these supposed suicide bombers in France. I mean, these guys are just able to coordinate things. And you wonder, where is... Where is all this intelligence? I mean, aren't, aren't we able to pick up on cell phone calls nowadays? I mean, aren't we able to target some of this, um, the movement and ability of these people that are apparently operating out of their little, uh, I mean, what kind of equipment does ISIS have? We know they took, they, they got the Toyota trucks that we sent them, that we sent Al-Nusra and they got it. They, they took them from Al-Nusra. They took some tanks. Okay. I mean, geez, is that really enough to take down Russia and America? And, and not to mention all these other countries that I've sp spoken of and the intelligence. I mean, what kind of just communication technology do they have that we don't have? I thought we had spy aircraft. I thought we had spy satellites. I mean... We talk in America for years now about them being able to listen to every cell phone call. And yet, for some reason, these people are able to terrorize the world. And I've pointed out many times, you know, 
you don't play into the terrorist hands the way it appears we are by reporting to your country how everything that they say they're going to do you know we're allowing the terrorists to terrorize us which when I grew up that seems to be exactly the opposite response that you give to terrorists you you go in and show them how strong and how committed you are to not allowing such a thing so now what I'm seeing is that and again I just want to point out that if you go back and listen to what I was saying even over months and months ago that this ISIS would have to get so terrible that we weren't gonna stop them yet because this is their mission from in the bigger agenda they have to be raised up to terrorize the world so in order to do that well they have to keep getting away with everything and so one of these things it's also a little scary from uh, the 19th a few days ago I don't know what BGR news is so I'll let people search that BGR news someone named Chris Smith from November 19th title Isis says soda cam bomb detonated on Russian plane got the wrong target and what they're pointing out here dad is that uh, they meant I'll just go ahead and read this a few days after the Paris attacks that left hundreds dead and injured Russia confirmed that a homemade explosive device was detonated on board Metrojet Flight 9268 in October, killing all 224 passengers. Since then, ISIS published images of the bomb that was detonated inside the airplane, saying that the Russian flight wasn't the original target. Instead, ISIS wanted to shoot down a Western plane. And I find it quite interesting that, of course, if you were ISIS and, well, you would think you know that you're sort of outgunned and you're out, uh, you've got inferior technology, ultimately, than the people you're after, meaning America, Russia, NATO. I mean, you're a little band of rebels, we were told some months ago, with a couple of strongholds. Uh, in Iraq and Syria driving around some Toyota trucks and tanks but you haven't got fighter jets you haven't got space weapons you haven't got uh, spy satellites and such so you would think that you wouldn't want to give away all your tactics like telling the West haha we're sneaking terrorists in with the refugees and then here as it said in this the lead into this article Isis published images of the bomb that was detonated inside the airplane well of course it couldn't bend the bomb because that bomb was detonated or I guess it was they put that they took a picture of it before they detonated it and now they're showing us what it is and it's it's a Schweppes can uh, they're showing ex exactly what it is so I find that quite interesting that this group that must at least feel that they have inferior firepower is happy to show us how they did it and exactly what it looks like because they wouldn't expect us then to key in on that sort of thing that would then limit their potential in the future so I just try and raise these points dad to let the listeners in on some of the the insight that I feel we're trying to share with people as to why this is a wag the dog Hollywood BS terrorism that we're watching and no kind of r religious radicalism these are not religious people Islam is not a religion of terrorizing people there's nothing in the Quran about chopping people's heads off and killing people and terrorizing the world for Allah that's you know if anything that was planted through the Wahhabism that's that the British put into Saudi Arabia that's been fostered by the terrorism that Israel has brought to that region for you know 60 years now and as we've talked about the 
the uh, slogan of the Mossad is, through deception, thou will make war. What deception? You mean being terrorists and making out your enemy to be terrorists? Something like that? Anyway, it all is just quite um, incongruous to imagine that it's going on in any way that they're presenting to us. So ISIS is just able to terrorize the world with inferior communications equipment, no sort of satellite equipment like we have or that the NATO has access to, no sort of intelligence network that their enemies have access to, and yet they're able to tell us everything they're going to do, and we are happy to publish it and scare the dickens out of all of our people around the world, and then, and then they're able to just pull it off even though we know what's coming. So I find this quite unbelievable. Um, you know, there, and now we have the latest thing is that Russia and America, you know, we're all friends now against ISIS. I mean, a few weeks ago, we were presenting the difficulty that Russia was involved and we're at cross purposes with Russia. They want to keep Assad in there. We want Assad out of there. So they're not only, you know, threatening or talking about bombing ISIS targets, but they're actually bombing the moderate rebels who we're giving the guns to to fight ISIS because they don't want those moderate rebels to fight Assad. And so we were predicting or we were presenting that this uh, that there was a potential for un unintentional consequences. Uh, the president of the United States said, you know, uh, disaster that there was potential for disastrous consequences and now all of a sudden we're all we're all in solidarity over this over this Paris attack and now everybody's working together to get Isis and and I'm gonna go ahead and predict that this is a lead up to the unsealing spoken of in Revelation that this good king, this righteous king, this white horse that's given a crown to go conquering, this is all setting up that we might get behind the good king so that all the guns can be pointed at the targets that he tells us to point them at. And as we've been saying for many a year, it, there's only one human being on the planet that really is in that position, and that's the the Hashemite king of Jordan. And it turns out this week that the Hashemite king of Jordan has been chosen by this league of nations, so to speak, these nations now that are trying to figure out what to do, that he's been chosen as the Muslim king to help coordinate the effects or the, the plans and the, uh, and the intelligence in that region. So I see that all is setting up in one of these articles out of the uh, AFP from Saturday says Russia pounds IS jihadists with quote four Paris bombs. So this is all part of the you know the heartstrings propaganda. Even Russia now they're writing that you know they're they're in solidarity because their plane was blown up and Paris was attacked and so Russia and, and France are both on the same team and the, and the, uh, the military over there in Syria, the Russian military is, is writing for our people and for Paris on the bombs that they're loading onto the planes to go again, bomb what targets, you know, what, what are all these bombs reaching? I mean, how many targets could there be? You know, there's a there's a Business Insider article again this week, and you can always look forward to fabulous graphics in the Business Insider articles because they know exactly where everybody's at. And this article from the Business Insider from November 17th, Dad, by Jeremy Bender, is titled. 
an ISIS defector just revealed how the group could start to fracture. So they're planting the seeds of of the uh, the, poten the potential demise of ISIS from the fact that they can't trust the people within their own ranks. These be the, they're having trouble <laughs> with their so-called caliphate because they're recruiting people from all over the world but these people from all over the world are potentially more loyal to their nationalism or other um, uh, loyalties than they are to ISIS and so this becomes a, a chink in the in the armor if you will but what I wanted to say about uh, the, the Business Insider article is, of course, they've got every area where the Syrian army is, where the Islamic State is, where al-Nusra is, where the Syrian rebels are, where the Kurdish forces are. They seem to know right where everybody is. And what I found interesting is, you know, you think of Islamic State as controlling some large zone of Syria. I mean, where are we bombing? We're not bombing the whole country of Syria because as you can learn from Business Insider, I don't know where they're getting their intelligence, but wherever it is, what they're showing us is that, you know, Islamic State controls a very small portion of Syria. Uh, only a couple of cities, and then I don't know what's out there in the rest of it, you know, a bunch of, I mean, <laughs> What are we bombing for a year? How many targets are there? Another article pointed out how Russia's killed 1,300 people since they've started bombing. Uh, and again, they know exactly how many civilians, exactly how many ISIS fighters. America has killed about 3,600 people, it says, 6% civilians, mostly ISIS. I mean, we seem to even have a body count. And yet, I don't know, have we blown up any of these Toyota trucks yet? I mean, where, how many targets could all these bombs be reaching? If you wanted to bomb the entire city of Raqqa, how long would it take to destroy every significant bridge, road, overpass, electric plant, water plant? I mean, how long would it take? to shut these people you know what kind of communication equipment are they using dad i mean do they have something special that doesn't take electric lines or satellites hookups or you know because uh, what what sort of intelligence equipment you know you mean we can't intercept any you know how are they getting their messages from syria to africa to tell the people what who to go kill and what to do how are they coordinating? And why can't we put a, a you know, a, a hindrance on those communications? This is the part that just, I still can't find any journalism that can answer that or even ask these questions. What, uh, it just keeps telling us that we're bombing, that we're bombing. <laughs> so anyway, and another picture in this Business Insider shows some lonely hill with a tiny little, it, it reminds me of Jamaica, a little stone structure like a Jamaican would live in. You know, it's like the size of a cell, like eight by 10 foot structure. It's got some sort of flag on top of it. I, I don't know if that's an Islam. It's not the ISIS flag. I don't know if that's supposed to be a caliphate flag. I, I'm not familiar enough with all of their uh, insignias, but it's this tiny little stone structure there's four men surrounding it. Uh, they have their hands in their pockets. It's on a hill overlooking a what looks like a city. I'll see if it tells us where it is. Nope, it doesn't. I guess this is supposed to convince me uh, that this is, I, I don't know what this is. There's a couple of little chairs. I mean, I, I have no idea what this is. I don't see a gun. None of the men are holding a gun, so doesn't look very threatening, this particular uh, uh, stronghold or whatever this is here that they're showing me. Again, where is the journalism that shows this deadly army 
that can't be stopped? Where are the battles and the battlegrounds that are that are convincing the world that ISIS is such a force? I, I still haven't seen a one, Dad. You know, since I made the call, that first picture in that Associated Press article that showed the black flag being carried by a single person on a quiet street who seemed to have gotten out of a nice, clean, white minivan parked on a, what looks like a nice, um, um, you know, neighborhood residential street somewhere in the Middle East. The only other person in the picture was a little kid on his bicycle that was turned back looking at this photo shoot. And as I said then, it looked like a photographer walking backwards in front of the guy with the flag saying, okay, come on, give me some ISIS, give me some ISIS, give me some ISIS. Thanks, let's go get some pancakes. You know, that was our announcement that this ISIS had been born. And since then, you know, I, I've seen nothing that looks like these people are, um, you know, are any sort of real force. Now, uh, here's another article from uh, CBS News, November 18th. Obama offers to work with Russia against ISIS under one condition. And I see that now we're getting to the, you know, again, what I have to point out, if you just want to see whether we have our finger on the pulse, what have I been saying? We're not going to war with Russia yet. There has to be this, this white horse king that goes forth conquering and to conquer. Who's he going to go conquer? Russia? No. He's got to go conquer ISIS on behalf of the world, on behalf of Israel. I still maintain that until Israel is threatened, you're not going to really see the reality of this come to pass. ISIS ha has to threaten Israel like they're threatening the world. So I think we've still got more false flags coming. But this article offers us up the idea that U.S. and Russia are ready to, the whole world's ready to work together. Um, I'll just read the first couple of paragraphs of this. The Russian Prime Minister said that the best way to combat the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria is to unite with the West, and Russia is already coordinating airstrikes with France. While President Obama seems to agree, he said there is a catch. Russia must first help end the Syrian war. Just days after Russia launched its first significant strikes against ISIS stronghold of Raqqa, President Obama extended an offer, quote, if we get a better understanding with Russia about the process for bringing an end to the Syrian civil war, that obviously opens up more opportunities for coordination with respect to ISIL, Mr. Obama said, using another acronym for ISIS. So, uh, you know, this is what I've been predicting, that what Russia was brought in to do by the powers that be that are that are really behind all of this is to get the all the military in place that can lead to Armageddon that military won't be needed until Armageddon but 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 or or the war that starts that finally ends in Armageddon but that's not the first war to start as we know from or as we anticipate dad for many years from the scripture it's going to start with this white horse this righteous king that's given a crown of honor and he goes forth conquering and to conquer and out of that has to come a seven-year covenant with many peoples nations and languages uh, which is what's being set up right now the whole world is looking for some sort of uh peace, if you will, or at least uh, an end to this war, this scourge, as we talked about, that was predicted from at least 50 years ago, that brings on the Third World War. And that, from what we understand of the prophecy, has to, the seven-year covenant, has to have uh, provisions that allow the Jews to rebuild their temple on Temple Mount. That's what's coming not a war with Russia. I will go ahead and just, again, give people some way to 
to gauge whether I've got my finger on the pulse or New York Times has their finger on the pulse. The New York Times that was praising the Arab Spring. The New York Times that's telling you ISIS is this real threat of Islamic radicals, which don't exist in reality. There is no such thing as Islamic radicals, even even uh, as there exists no such thing as Christian terrorists. There's no such thing as a Christian terrorist. There's terrorists that call themselves Christian, but that can quickly be shown to not be Christian. So terrorists that claim to be Christian are no more Christian than terrorists that claim to be Martians. I mean, it doesn't, right? Would, would we start calling them Martian terrorists if they said they were from from Mars? Or would the journalist point out that, well, in fact, these aren't Martians, you know? <laughs> They're, they're funded by some other people on Earth. So anyway, uh, what I'm seeing in this article is that we're, we're getting ready to make the nice uh, agreement here to get everybody on the same side. And what this will result in is this third uprooting that we've been looking for, Dad, of Syria. Because uh, the prophecy always said that three kingdoms, three horns, would be uprooted to make way for this little kingdom that's going to rise up and the mouth speaking great things. And of course, the great things are that we can all get along. We don't have to fight. But this is going to lead ultimately to a Sunni Shia civil war that will bring in the guns on both sides, bring Iran in on one side and, and NATO on the other. And that's why all the guns are being set up now. And and so um, right now we're at this process where all the big hype, the saber rattling with Russia, all the threats are now giving way to a sort of back slapping, hey, let's all, you know, now that, oh, now that an atrocity's occurred in France, which, by the way, I also predicted Several weeks ago, I didn't say France, but I said it would be France or England or Italy or Germany. One of the major European nations would have to have some sort of false flag so that Europe could be galvanized in into this, what the president of France has now called a, an act of war against them. So, you know, I predicted that and and the reason that it's easy to predict that is because ISIS is not real and they need the world to be scared to death of them all the way to the point where Israel's scared to death. So Russia and America are not going to fight over this yet. We're going to get behind this white horse king to help us defeat ISIS. That's what has to be coming first. Um, Another interesting piece of this puzzle seems to have surfaced, as far as I can tell, out of the Associated Press just yesterday on Saturday by Ali Akbar uh, Darini, if I'm pronouncing that right, out of Tehran. Iran guard simulates capture of Al-Aqsa Mosque. So they're telling us in this article that the Iranians, uh, thousands, of paramil thousands of paramilitary forces from Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard have held a war game simulating the capture of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque from Israel's control, state media reported Saturday. It said forces stormed and liberated a replica of the mosque in the exercise. So, of course, this really does fit with the Quranic prophecy that eventually the forces uh, of Islam will liberate that uh, that mount, that temple mount. And, and so this is what will fuel this, uh, this war that we talked about last week, predicted where Israel and Islam will... Uh, the, the war must be conducted in such a way that they mutually destroy each other. Well, of course, it's part of the Judeo-Christian scripture as well that uh, that the Jews will be destroyed to the point where they have to flee 
to the place that's prepared for them. And this will be right before the, their true Messiah returns to save them. So I see this is, again, this isn't going to happen next week, in my opinion. These are things that are all being set up now uh, to get us ready for the war that's coming that uh, Iran is now being seen to be preparing for what can be shown as part of their uh, destiny, their scripture, that their forces expect that they're going to take over Jerusalem at some point. You know, that, that point, when you listen to Sheikh Imran Hossein, is not until the very end. It's not until the true Mahdi, the, the righteous king, leads them against these terrorists state of Israel. And of course, it points out in this article that Iran has never uh, accepted. They've never acknowledged the state of Israel. And they demand that Israel leave that land because, of course, that's that hard line from that side that's there to uh, point out that these people are not God's people, that they have no right to that land. They're just a terrorist organization funded to come in there and and uh, and make a play for that territory and that their Zionist agenda from over a hundred years ago is to take over all that land from the Nile to the Euphrates and that that's what's going on now either you know and, and Sheikh Imran Hossein where he and I disagree dad or, or we see it differently is he imagines that that's the deeper play going on that it really is the terrorist state of Israel coming up against the the Islamic uh, states or the Islamic people and that the Islamic people are then being funded and led uh, falsely into what amounts to these these jihads that are not Islamic at all. And he doesn't seem to acknowledge, and I questioned last week, I don't say that it's true. I simply say it's very hard to reconcile world history in light of these predictions that these uh, agents of the Illuminati, whoever they are, are to foment this war between Israel and the Islamic State. So if you go back to this time of the late 19th century, when these very people alleged to have made this prediction, alleged to have uh, set up this uh, this future where it would be accomplished in three world wars, that it's coincidentally at the same time of the beginning of this Zionist agenda. So, you know, it's quite easy for me to imagine that this Zionist agenda is part of this agent of the Illuminati. This whole thing, because we know it's got nothing to do with religion. We know it's not, you know, even the, even many of the Orthodox Jews and the Semitic Jews are, you know, they recognize that this Zionist agenda is not what they read in their scriptures, what they expect God to be doing and uh, and even even whether you know they don't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, but they realize their Messiah, their true Messiah, would not come in the way of this state of Israel, this terrorist state led by a a Mossad whose slogan is "Through deceit, thou shalt make war." So even within their own people, uh, the Semitic people, uh, you know, is a is a line drawn there that acknowledges that the state of Israel is not what it claims to be. And so if, if you broaden the perspective to imagine that the state of Israel is a pawn in the game, as, as Guy William Guy Carr wrote, the title of his book, Pawns in the Game, that this is, you know, this agent of the Illuminati to foment this war, to have a war with Islam, they have to have this state. This state has to be a terrorist state. This state has to be pushing the boundaries. And on the other side of it, these Islamic territories have to be somewhat controlled. And so, 
you know, again, is it, is it just a coincidence that from the time of the end of the First World War, the, the Hashemite kingdom that was promised the caliphate then had it taken from them and given to this extremist group, these Wahhabis, right? This Wahhabism in the kingdom of Saud. That's not, you know, that's not Islamic. They're claiming Islam in the same way the, you know, the Catholics and the Jesuits are claiming Christianity. But it doesn't take five minutes study to see that, you know, this, this uh, Western Christianity, what Sheikh Imran Hossein calls Santa Claus Christianity, has nothing to do with the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. This is a fabricated Christianity for some other purpose in the world, riding on the riding on the reality of Jesus Christ and, and the reality of the original Orthodox Church. Well, I mean, so there you go on the Islamic side. You've got this kingdom of Saud claiming to be the holy uh, caliphate or the the keepers of the holy sites supported by the you know the terrorist state of England originally and and then now coincidentally enough best friends all of my life with America the, the the great and free country that has to fight for freedom and democracy around the world that we're going to praise an Arab Spring but not as long as it doesn't disturb, you know, as long as it doesn't disturb Saudi Arabia, the most, you know, the most closed, unfree, religiously harsh and undemocratic part of that entire world over there. Funny how we've never felt it necessary to push our Saudi, our friend Saudi Arabia to be more liberal, to be more democratic. But we had to go in and you know, help them take out Mubarak, help them take out Libya's leader, you know, Libya with the one of the highest standards of living in the entire Arab world, certainly in Africa. But we needed to help those people get freedom and democracy, which funny enough, all of our weapons and all of our resources and all of our influence has only resulted in what we were predicting at that time, which was destabilization and the rise of extremism. So, you know, you have to really be a little bit brain dead or unwilling to look at history to imagine that we've just overlooked Saudi Arabia and not required them to have any of, of the uh, democratic progress that we seem to require of everyone else in the region. And so that doesn't fit the narrative that we give in our history and our schools about our great and free country, but it certainly does fit the narrative of agents of the Illuminati being raised up to foment this third world war when the time comes. And so along with that, you have now the modern state of Jordan also supported at the time by England when they took away the, 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 the Kelly fate that they'd promised them and then carved out Syria and gave it to France and carved out Jordan and gave it to the Hashemites. And then, okay, who's been the best friend of Israel? The Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And so, you know, all the way from the late 50s, uh, uh, overthrowing the, the, the leader of Iran and putting in the Shah of Iran, a, a, you know, a ruthless dictator. Same thing we did in South America. I mean, the pattern is just so clear that it's, you know, how is it even possible that we could, we could have such an influence on the region for, for so many decades and then now suddenly we are, you know, we're we're bombing this region that we've had such an influence on for a year and we can't even put a dent in this band of rebels who can't even keep their own people interested in their agenda as i said in this this article from business insider that you know the problem 
with Islamic State right now is that uh, that they have defection potential or problems within their own that they can't trust these different people that they're recruiting because their loyalties. Well, I mean, come on, this is this is a religious caliphate. These are people committed to the to what is spoken of in the Quran as the righteous caliphate that will come one day and lead the world in righteousness. I mean, come on, this is... So anyway, Dad, it's really, it's... I know I'm jumping around a little today, but I, I keep feeling like I have to plant the seeds of evidence in people's minds because this, the, the sea, the ocean of misinformation and propaganda is is like the sky all around us it's you know there's there is no escaping it it's as if i'm telling people the sky is orange and everybody's looking up and saying no it's not it's blue well yeah okay that's what the propaganda is telling you and it sounds like my story is so different but if you're able to pull some of the the pieces together and ask some of the right questions that none of the journalists are even allowed to ask, right? I mean, it's it's just absurd to me. Why? Are, where are the pictures of the reality of ISIS? Where is the technology in which ISIS is able to pull this off? You know this. You know this one article about the the French that got a hold of the master, the ringleader of the Paris attacks was from a discarded cell phone that happened to have the information on it leading to the cousin of this person who conveniently blew herself up. And the um, the cell phone, of course, had a message on it and that said, uh, it's begun, we're off, it started. So, you know, naturally, naturally, this highly trained group of people who are able to outsmart and outwit the greatest military the world's ever known with all the, the equipment, right? We, like I say, we are the ones with the spy planes. We're the ones with the satellites. We're the ones with the space weapons. You know, we're the ones, I thought, with all the high tech. And we're told Russia's got all the same stuff, which makes them so potent and dangerous. And yet, not NATO, not Russia, not France. Nobody can intercept a call. But these guys with cell phones, you know, a 28-year-old ringleader is able to move around and coordinate these attacks with cell phones. And then, you know, they're, they're just uh, sloppy enough to throw the cell phone in a garbage can because, of course, they don't have any training like our special forces guys. I mean, you'd think you could have at least stomped on the cell phone first, right, to make... So, so that they couldn't access the information because that's how they found this guy. You know, it's like Sheikh Imran Hossein points out. It's so interesting how all these, you know, the terrorists always leave, you know, their dead bodies leave a, a, a live passport in it that leads to their identification. Or like with 9-11, you know, planes that evaporate on impact just happen to leave perfectly um you know, passports in perfectly intact uh, behind so that we can, we have the evidence of who perpetrated the attacks. All of this stuff is so absurd. You know, it's, that's why I keep trying to jump around between subjects and between elements of this, because I don't know how else to help people get a handle on the wag the dog nature of it. And, and there's nothing more effective to me than the one thing that you will never hear anyone else talk about, except for the, you know, the few insignificant voices on the internet, that planes cannot fly into buildings. I'm sorry, the the twin towers were built at a time when most of the passenger jets were larger than the 727s that flew, that that, that were supposedly used on 9/11. So the buildings were not only made to withstand multiple impacts of passenger airliners, but passenger airliners that were even larger than the ones that we were told hit them. So how is it that they didn't, they not only didn't, they they didn't withstand even a single impact, 
but it wasn't an impact but a complete penetration like the building was made of paper. I mean, really, I think if the, if the Twin Towers were made of cardboard, it would have put up a little more resistance to the airliner than it looked like it did on the, on the Hollywood shot that we were all shown. So, I, you know, I, people I know are very sensitive to that because you're supposed to be un-American and you're supposed to be a conspiracy theorist if you bring up the fact that in the known universe that we live in, aluminum airplanes just can't do that. Airplanes just can't do that. The buildings were made to withstand impacts and the wingtips of airplanes are just aluminum. And, and we were shown that they sliced right into the buildings and they not only did, but they flew right into the buildings without even slowing down. Now, that just can't happen. And so I, I keep referring to that because it's, it's the same context I want to paint in all of this. ISIS just can't happen. We, we have the technology that we don't let a bunch of crazy people with swords in the Middle East take over the world, terrorize the citizens of the world with nothing but a few Toyota trucks and a couple of tanks and I don't know, cell phones, walkie-talkies. I keep asking, I'm asking this of the people listening and of the journalists writing, what technology are they using to coordinate all of their attacks that we're so afraid of? And why are they so confident that they're willing to tell this highly technological world that they're trying to fight exactly what they're doing and how they're going to do it? They're showing us a picture of the bomb that took down the Russian plane. You know, why would you do that? Unless it's, I mean, to play devil's advocate, I would answer because it's not really the bomb they're tricking us. They're showing us what they're saying is the bomb so that, the, that we'll be misled to look for that kind of bomb, but really they're using something else. I mean, that's, I'm answering the question for those out there that don't even ask the question. It's the only answer. They're, sh they're saying things to mislead us. They're saying we're sneaking in jihadists and terrorists with the refugees because, of course, they're too smart to try and do that but it's good enough to mislead us and make us chase after our tails or red herrings so that we really aren't looking where, where they are working. But again, it still leads me to, okay, so how are they doing this? How in the world did they hijack planes from us, fly them around our airspace, and then fly them into buildings like the buildings were made of paper mache? How, I mean, how did that happen? You know, it didn't is the answer, people. It didn't happen. And so if you if you don't start looking to some sort of context, whether it's the one that I've been pointing out for a long time or not, whether it's the one that Guy Carr was pointing out in 1958 or not, whether it's the one that Sheikh Imran Hossein has been pointing out for years or not, you know, to keep watching your New York Times and your CBS and your Associated Press, you know, most of this stuff can't happen. It just can't happen. So I think the other thing I wanted to point out that if I can find the article, I, I, I may not be able to find it right now or the part of the article I wanted to read. It, it's got to do with, you know, what I want to point out is what's coming. Because I say I, I want to at least, um, I want to keep giving my own insight as well as interpretation so that the more people that listen, they might start passing us along, Dad, as a, a resource that's been accurate. And so um, this is back to that first article that I started with Robert Burns and Lolita Baldor from the AP Pentagon pressing allies for more help against Islamic State. And this part of the article says um, Carter, this is our... Uh, Defense Secretary said uh, U.S. officials say they detect more European interest in contributing to the military campaign in Syria, where many governments have stayed largely on the sidelines. This is what I'm trying to 
point out, Dad, is where we're going with this is that I've been saying for so long, we have to get everybody involved. Everybody has to be up in arms all over the world, fighting on every street practically. And, and already I have read in France, there's, of course, backlash against Muslims for what happened and people starting to, you know, the, the hate and the, and the fear is coming out into the citizenry in the streets. Okay, so U.S. officials say they detect more European interest in contributing to the military campaign in Syria where many governments have stayed largely on the sidelines. But the officials acknowledge that it will be difficult to get more from budget-strapped countries already involved elsewhere in the world. Chances of drawing significant additional help from Arab nations seems even slimmer. Defense Secretary Ash Carter has made clear that the basic U.S. strategy is not changing, but during an hour-long meeting with top advisors and commanders earlier this week, Carter said now is the time to reach out to European allies for support in the fight against the Islamic State group, according to senior defense officials. The official said Carter asked his top advisors to reach out to Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Turkey for additional military support. The request span a range of options from equipment and supplies to trainers and special operations forces. Italy has provided tornado fighter jets for reconnaissance missions, weapons for Kurdish fighters, and training units in Iraq, and has said it would consider playing a more active role in Iraq combating the Islamic State group, but that no decision has been made. I don't know how many countries, again, Islamic State, what do they have that all of these Western countries don't have that we just can't, we just can't get a handle on these guys? The U.S. push for broader support for military action in Syria and Iraq comes as France has intensified its aerial bombing in Syria, and Russia has widened its air campaign in Syria after concluding that the Islamic State group was behind the bomb that brought down a Russian passenger jet in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Uh, Carter told an interviewer on Monday that the Paris attacks have had a galvanizing effect on U.S. cooperation with France, including in the sharing of intelligence. He noted, that, I mean, isn't that, oh, I guess we have just weren't sharing intelligence with France. Before. It's just, it's not enough that we've got a civil war going in Syria that's, that we're told is threatening all of Europe's future with the refugee crisis, that's threatening the world with, with terrorism, right? But now that a bomb went off in France, killing 124, you know, let's forget all the rest of the terrorism and all the promises of terrorism and all the potential of this quagmire that Cheney talked about 20 years ago. But now it's, I mean, this is what's so absurd about our reporting and our journalism. Carter told an interviewer on Monday that the Paris attacks have had a galvanizing effect on U.S. cooperation with France, including in the sharing of intelligence. He noted that the French responded with immediate airstrikes against IS targets and said the United States is looking for new ways to improve the effectiveness of its military campaign. Now, so does that mean the French, Dad, you think, have certain IS targets in mind that we don't know about because we haven't been sharing our intelligence with them? I mean, again, how many targets are there? Now the French are bombing targets, Russia's bombing targets, America's been bombing them for a year, but I guess these are different targets because we're not sharing intelligence completely with France. We know we're not sharing intelligence with Russia since a few weeks ago we were told what a potential for disaster it was that Russia's even bombing some of the people we're supplying with arms. I mean... But now French has responded with immediate airstrikes against IS targets. Which targets? Ones that we haven't been bombing for a year? You know, what are they able to do that we haven't done, that Russia hasn't done in the last couple of months? How many targets are there? Are there targets that French knows about, that France knows about, that we don't know about? <laughs> to go on 
before I finish in this article. Quote, we need others to get in the game as well, he told a forum sponsored by the Wall Street Journal. So I'm hoping that this tragedy has the effect of galvanizing others as it has galvanized the French and really throughout Europe. Because remember, Europe has been participating in part in operations against ISIL, but not notably most of them in Syria so far. Quote, Belgium, Britain, Denmark, and the Netherlands are flying missions in Iraq, but not in Syria. <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, uh, the whole world is flying missions, and from what we've been told, Dad, or what I've gotten out of the propaganda media, ISIS has two main cities that they are in control of, one in Iraq and one in Syria, right? Mosul in Iraq. If I'm, if I'm correct, and, and Raqqa in Syria. Perhaps there's, I mean, I, I'm just, how big are these countries? How, how many targets are there? What, where, what, how many bombs have been dropped and on what? How many times can you bomb a bridge or a road or a water treatment plant? I mean, what are they bombing? They, apparently we're not, we haven't been able to locate these tanks that we left them or the or the Toyota trucks that we sent them. Nobody, I mean, show me a picture where one of these countries blew up one of the Toyota trucks so we can all cheer. Hey, I mean, what are we bombing? Derek Cholet, a senior advisor at the German Marshall Fund of the United States who previous, previously served as, as Assistant Defense Secretary for International Security, said the Paris attacks may give other European nations the political will and public support they need. So anyway, I think I'll leave it at that, Dad. That it's, it's quite obvious to me that uh, what this is all resulting in is that the rest of the world's got to be brought into this. And of course, that now, I believe, will be responded to by ISIS or I should say the agenda will now move forward in that false flags can occur in other nations and it can be because, you know, they're helping, right? Just like France. France was helping bomb and that's why we were told that the attacks occurred on France. And so now if other nations are willing to get involved, well, ISIS, what are they going to do? I mean, they're so powerful. They've got the whole world running scared. If you're ISIS and this narrative is, you know, this propaganda narrative is to be taken at face value, then, you know, wouldn't you be saying, okay, well, let's show these, you know, if Russia's going to pick up the attacks, well, let's bomb more of Russia's stuff. You know, we, we read that the soda can bomb was actually meant for Western targets. And when you read that article, I guess it's just that, it wound up on a, a, a Russian plane, uh, if not accidentally, but as a consolation that what they meant to do, what they meant to do was take down a Western target. And so I believe that's very significant for all of us in the West because um, this isn't going to stop yet. It can't. Or if it does, then I'm happy to be wrong about all this. But if I'm right about all this, then I would look, and, I, and I'm afraid coming into this Christmas season is a, is a horribly appropriate time if you're on the ISIS narrative for ISIS to, you know, really galvanize the world. If you want to see the world outraged, imagine, you know, our holiday season being accompanied by terrorist bombings that are killing innocent people around the world. And so um, I, I still believe that this has to lead to the threat against Israel. Uh, only for the reason, I'm, I'm projecting back into the prophecy now, because where do you get your Messiah? How does Israel claim a Messiah that brings them peace and safety if the Messiah doesn't 
stop the threat of this Islamic State or some other caliphate force like Iran that threatens to march on Jerusalem or you know something along in that context I don't want to try and lay out any specifics beyond that because of course I don't know I only know the the direction this is all going because it not only was laid down in prophecy from Daniel 2600 years ago um, but then it's been laid down since then through scripture in Revelation through Paul talking about the Antichrist already at work in his time, through the Quranic scriptures 600 years later, talking about Dajjal, the Antichrist of the Jews, uh, coming into the world. And as Sheikh Imran Hussein says, Dad, that the, anti the, the Dajjal's point of view must be to impersonate the actual Messiah, which means he's got to rule the world from Jerusalem and so uh, you know this part of the puzzle has to somehow fit into the you know what then comes down to us all the way when you skip forward to the 19th century now with this Illuminati with these 33rd degree Masons with this uh, with this Zionistic agenda that now comes to be and not only comes to be, but follows, it, it immediately gets followed by World War I. And World War I winds up doing exactly what was, is quoted by Guy Carr in 58 that supposedly was written in the late 19th century uh, about creating communism and atheism and starting to stomp out religion out of the nations of the world. And so it not only did that by, by the funding that went to the, to the Bolshevik Revolution to start destroying Christian Russia, but it also uh, funded this, this Balfour Declaration that, that, uh, that results in the state of Israel. And that all begins with this, you know, taking the, the caliphate away from the Hashemite king that was hired or, or was recruited by the British to help them defeat the Ottomans after the Ottomans had, had done what they were hired to do 500 years earlier, which was to destroy Orthodox Christianity from its roots, which, of course, was in Turkey. In that part of the world that's that's where the the first church was the seven churches that are in Asia written in Revelation where do people think that is that's all in the area of Greece and Turkey and where the Ottomans went and uh, you know funded by the Catholic Church to destroy their competition and then when that was done the whatever this agenda is funded the Russia on one side, promised them Constantinople to come and fight from the north and recruited the Hashemite king of the Muslims from the other side, promising them a caliphate to get rid of the Ottomans who were claiming to be the caliphate. And, uh, you know, and that's what leads into our modern history. And, and, and modern history, I say, is, you know, the last hundred years is, is, when, when you look at a, a much grander scale, you know, 100 years isn't a lot. And in that 100 years, three world wars, um, they all seem quite separate in the way history's been presented to us. But I want to keep presenting that they're not, in fact, separate, but they're part of, a, they're part of this 100-year plan or a plan that's reached its final 100 years. And and that's the one that I think is most interesting to discuss. Is this plan something of the bankers, like we talked about last week, that Professor Quigley uh, talked about, where there's this group of this cabal of the richest, most powerful men in the world that have plans to run the world in, in the way the Roman Empire did, to have complete control 
of every continent, of all the people, of all the ec economy and resources of the world? Or is that really just the sort of the surface level of a much deeper plan that goes to this idea of the Antichrist, the false deliverer, the one that's been at work for 2,000 years, the one that the Quran says is uh, is pulling the strings that Sheikh Imran Hossein points to. So anyway, Dad, uh, this is this is what I hope to add to the discussion this week, and thanks for having me on the show. I miss you. I hope uh, everybody stays safe. I would just uh, yeah tell people be very careful out there around the cities and the popular areas. Of course, don't fear these terrorists because um, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Don't be afraid to die. Just die for the right thing. All right, Dad, I'll talk to you next week. Love you. Well, thank you very much, Tony. That was indeed a very educational uh, show that we put on today. And I thank you very much for it. And folks, if this is edifying you, then uh, remember why we do this. This is a storehouse where you get your meat. Because the Lord said you give to the storehouse where you get your meat so that meat's available to all of those who come seeking it 24-7. This ministry has been doing that for a long, long time. Over 20 years now on the internet. And the Lord uses a symbol for that giving to that storehouse. You see, you give with frankincense. That's how you give. Frankincense in the old days, in the time of the tabernacle in the wilderness, represented to a Jew hilarity and joy. God wanted the gift that they gave to him to be done with hilarity and joy. That's why he wanted them to burn that frankincense along with it. It was to teach them. That lesson in that wilderness is the same to us today. To teach us that we give to God what he asks and we give it to him his way. He asks to have the gift to the storehouse where you get your meat given with frankincense, hilarity and joy. Because you know what you're doing and you're doing it on purpose. So folks, if this is the storehouse where you get your meat, then stand up and cheer and cheer loudly because it's offering time. Right at the top of our page at Brosal and over at the Philadelphia Church, there's a frankincense offering button not up in the title. And we appreciate those offerings. That's what keeps us in touch with the Lord and you in touch with the Lord. You do it for you because he asked you to. And it keeps this word coming to you. And so until we see you again next week, we thank you for the offering. But we want you to have a great...